Okay, uh, thank you everybody for coming out on this, uh, this rainy night. Uh, we've got an exciting talk uh, planned for you tonight, but uh, first I just want to remind everybody that the next talk will be on November 4th. Uh, it'll be Dr. Constantine, Constantine Runtos. Uh, he'll be doing a, uh, the time has come to grow with it, making the case for responsible offshore aquaculture. Um, so that'll mark that on your calendar. And the next talk will be Friday, December 2nd. The topic is still to be decided. We've got a couple topics there. They're fighting over the spot. So uh, as soon as we know that, Courtney will send out an email for the date. But um, tonight's talk um, is Rob, Rob D. Giovanni. Um, doing the math on the way here tonight, I realize I've been working with Rob for over 20 years now. Um, started uh, back at the Okinos days, uh, the Riverhead Foundation. Now he's at the um, Pacific Marine Mammal Center. Um, but Rob is also a Long Islander, so he went to Suffolk Community College graduated from LAU Southampton, and is also a graduate of Stony Brook as well. So um, with any more, I'll introduce Rob. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, well, thank you for the opportunity to speak uh, in front of you guys. I think it's great that um, after 25 years, we're going to talk about sea turtles and marine mammals and stuff here. When I was going to LIU, we had one marine mammal class. And, all we did was talk about what they look like. So hopefully now, uh, 25 years later, we're not only talking about uh, the animals that we could see, but we realize that they're here a lot more readily. And so uh, we're going to see if this technology works. So once again, trying to keep me on task is really difficult because I've spent 25 years working with Marine Mammal and Sea Turtle Stranding Program. I started in 92 um, with the Okinos Ocean Research Foundation, working on the Whale Watch boat working in the rescue program. I moved through the rescue program. We moved through the Riverhead Foundation. We moved to Riverhead and developed the rescue program there. Uh, we also did aerial surveys because one of the things that I thought from being on the whale watch boat was that, that it's a great platform of opportunity, but you only are looking at a small area and we want to know what's going on in a much broader area. So in 1998, I got off the boat, so to speak. Everybody who's older would remember that, never get off the boat, right? Um, but I got off the boat and started flying and, and doing aerial survey work, uh, not only in this area, but from uh, when I was driving here, I was trying to think about where I've surveyed, but I've surveyed from Florida to uh, Newfoundland looking for marine mammals and sea turtles at some point, and I think I have close to 8,000 hours in the air. Um, so it's, it's a lot of flying to get, well, the funnier part is to get these data points. You know, you see with this, or you might see a whale. So there's a lot of effort that goes into getting these data. Um, but before I go any, get any, any deeper into this, I want to make sure that I at least acknowledge how a lot of this work has been done. I mean, I, I thank the Riverhead Foundation for Marine Research Preservation for allowing us to use these photos. Um, the John H. Prescott Rescue Assistance Program is one of the programs that helped fund stranding programs, and that came about around 2002, which was one of the ways that we were able to start a satellite tagging program of animals that were rehabilitated. Uh, so without that support, we would never be able to do this, and, and rescue programs would be still in so-called dark ages. Um, volunteers, thousands of hours of volunteer time goes, goes into doing this work. Uh, and then I want to mention that one of the things that I did earlier on in my career was I realized that I was the guy who would always get in trouble for whatever you did, no matter how many times you guys did it. For some reason, I was always the one that was guilty. So we went out and got scientific research permits to do a lot of the work that needs to be done because every one of these animals that we're talking about are either protected, threatened, or endangered. And so based on the Marine Mammal Protection Act, um, basically these animals, you can't just go out and work with them like you normally would any other animal. So all the work that we've done has been collected by dotting the I and crossing the T. Um, I, st I stall on this a little bit because it is always frustrating that if you look at a marine mammal, it's okay, but if I look at it, I actually have to write a report and say I saw an animal and I to take. So, you know, I don't write a lot, so I don't like doing that, that much work. Um, I've covered all this already. Look at that. I'm already doing good on time. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to mention here about NOAA Fisheries and the Marine Mammal uh, Stranding Program and then the Sea Turtle Salvage Network is that these programs evolved from a basic concept of what's out there. So when I started this talk earlier, I mentioned that we didn't really talk about marine mammals that were here. Actually, sea turtles that were here, back in the 80s, it was thought that any sea turtle you had was lost to the population. 
Now we know that that's not true. Uh, actually, we know the opposite. We know that not only are they not lost, but it's probably a critical developmental habitat for these animals, so it's a lot more important than what we once thought. Um, so the salvage networks, the stranding programs provide, provided very valuable data to all, all of the, the people in the research community, but they also come with some biases. I mean, the animals have to come to you. What do they represent? And those are some of the questions that I've worked with over my career trying to find out what we would be doing. New York State Department of Environmental Conservation is actually the group that is overseeing the stranding program for New York, and then they work kind of with or under uh, NOAA Fisheries. So these programs started, and I'm going to give a little bit more of a, a historical perspective of what we encounter from a stranding perspective, and then talk about some of the research programs that we've been trying to integrate and how we can bring those partnerships together. Because one of the questions I always get whenever I would show up on the beach or I would get a question or a statement, it would say, I had no idea that whales were here. And I'm like, okay, have you ever heard of Cold Spring Harbor Whaling Museum? And people would be like, oh yeah, sure. Have you ever heard of Sag Harbor Whaling Museum? Oh yeah, sure. And I'm like, well, did you ever think that they put them where the whales were not? And they're like, well, no, actually. I said, so these animals were here at one time. We just didn't look for them as, as readily. And that's what Okino's Ocean Research Foundation did, is they went out and looked for whales off of Montauk and had a lot of sightings of animals that now we're looking at it. We have Gotham whale that was here with the table where we're seeing them in Western, Western Long Island. Those are things that are actually changes in our environment that we've seen in the last 20 years, which is really cool because we could study things forever and not see a change, and now we're seeing some, some really dramatic changes. So sea turtles in New York. Um, the threats to sea turtles in New York, we want to talk about what we have here because one of the things I've always heard from a lot of environmental managers early on in my career is, well, there's not a problem, or if you read an EIS statement, they'll say, they'll make this statement that says, there's not a problem because there aren't any animals here. And see, I agree that there might not be a problem. I just don't agree for the re with the reasoning. And so we need to start understanding that a little bit better. Um, and then we'll end up with talking about some satellite tagging, just because those are cool pictures. And then we're going to figure out how to get you guys to help and do work, because I shouldn't be the only one working and doing this right now, right? So let's see. Talking about this, this is a, a graph that we use. These, all these um, push pins here are actually stranding programs up and down the coast. This is for the greater Atlantic region, which is where stranding programs operate. But I always thought it was interesting. This came from NOAA. You're looking at this here, this area serves 56 million people, and almost half of them are, are involved in a coastline or something. So there's a huge number of people that we have interacting with our coastline every day. And that definitely has impacts, and the impacts are greater when we don't think that anything's there um, for us to, to be uh, bothered with. So what do we see? Because we're going to try to come back to sea turtles. Um, of the seven species of sea turtles that you can find uh, worldwide, we, we see four of them here in our waters. We see the, the green sea turtle up here in the corner. We see the endangered Kemp's Ridley. We see the loggerhead and the leatherback, which is the largest sea turtle in the world. Uh, can get to be upwards of 2,000 pounds. Probably see them at around 1,000 pounds here, so they're skinny um, or, or a lot lighter. But they get that big feeding predominantly on jellyfish. So it gives you an idea of, of these animals have different dietary needs. Feeds predominantly on jellyfish. These two right here feed predominantly on crabs, and this one here feeds predominantly on vegetation. So there's a lot of differences, so you can see that there's different habitats that they might uh, tend to encounter. Because graphs are really cool, I know that's really exciting, calm down. Um, I always point this graph out because it gives you an idea of what we've had. This is when the program really started recording data back in the 80s. This is the stranding program. And what you can see is obviously if you wanted to um, do work and, and have a lot of time to write and stuff, that was the 80s. You had plenty of time to actually sit down and do a lot of other, other things other than responding to animals. The 90s, which is when I started, uh, started to see an influx of seals come into our waters, and in, in particular, we started to see an influx of Arctic species seals coming in. So that was really interesting because we saw a change in, in what was going on. Um, the red bars are seals. So you can see that they've had a lot going on, pretty much that dominated the stranding program. The green bars are turtles, and the blue are actually uh, cetaceans, or dolphins and whales. And what you might notice is although whales and dolphins are pretty much a low number, they do seem to be increasing a little bit, and there's, there's a change in that. But 
we're going to talk a lot about sea turtles. And you can see this spike right here back in basically 85, 86, and 87. Uh, why it's important is because that's really when the stranding program started to really take off. Although in the 80s, does everybody remember Feisty the Whale? Sperm Whale? Okay. So that was, that's technically the first animal by the stranding program um, when it was really starting. And you talk to a lot of old timers. And I guess Chris is trying to say that I'm old. That's, I just realized that. I, I'm a little slow. Now, 20, 20 years, now I'm like, wow, I'm slow and old. Um, but you talk to old timers, and it was really an ad hoc group of people that came down to try and respond to this animal. Uh, but there wasn't a lot going on. And then, then you had this event in the 80s where they started to see a large number of turtles starting to come up. And that's where they started to realize these turtles were coming up, and they're not just dead. They're actually hypothermic or cold starting. And we're going to talk about that in, in a little bit. So that's really why the stranding program began, was to respond to turtles more than anything else. That was the biggest biggest thing that we dealt with, and then they kind of got SEALs involved, and, and then it kind of took off. Uh, you can see 2001, before I leave, was um, a banner year for SEALs. Uh, that was the year we had 185 SEALs come in in a four-month period to the program. 113 of them were Arctic species. The only cool thing about that data point is that we didn't see that many Arctic SEALs after that. Uh, there seemed to be a change towards gray seals. And we don't know why yet. It's one of the things that we're looking at um, as we evaluate some of these data. But this was the last big spike that we had related to, to Arctic seals. And the rest has been related to gray seals. So one of the things we want to know is we wanted to figure out how to take a vacation or take time off is figure out when things are coming up. So we can look at this and we can see there is a distinct uh, seasonality associated with, with strandings. Um, one of the other statements that I've heard from many people, when we would show up, uh, or seals would show up, everybody would say, oh, the seals are here, and they're getting sick because it's cold. And I'm like, well, probably not because they're coming from up north where it is cold, so that's not really the case that that's the problem. And you can see that we have a large number of them come in. At one point in time, uh, March and April, 80% of our strainings came in in those two months. Well, that also, for, for some of us in the room who actually go out and do seal counts or whenever um, Chris is out on the boat and looking at seals, I can remember when I used to be able to go out and do aerial surveys for seals and take one, I mean, this is way back before digital, one roll of 36 exposures and count all the seals around Long Island and, and never have to do that. Now we take hundreds of photos, mainly because it's digital and it's cool. Uh, but the other part is, is that you had a lot less animals here. This is when we have the peak number of animals on our haul-out sites. And so understanding what that means is, is, is really important as we go forward. You can see that July, well, June, July, August, all the way through to December is when we tend to get the green bars, which is sea turtles. And so the other thing that's interesting about that is there's a seasonality associated with live and dead turtles. During the summer months, we tend to get a lot of turtles that wash up on the beach dead for a variety of reasons, and we'll always go out and do a necropsy to try and determine the cause of death, and we have animals that are entangled in fisheries, we have ingestion or debris, we have ship strikes, we have, we, we can't under, understand why, so there's a lot of, uh, we would hope that there's a lot of variety across the board, but one of the things that it does show us is that there's a lot of threats to these animals. And then we have November and December, which is what we're moving into, is the time when animals will become cold stunned, and it's also the, the rare occurrence when we tend to get the most live animals that are, that are coming in. Um, and that was really the, the paradigm for many years. And only in the last five or six years, we've started to see a little bit of a change to seeing other live animals come up a little bit earlier. And those animals that we see coming up, um, for one, we see animals come up all around Long Island. So this is for seal strandings. You can see that every place, all the coasts, we tend to see a, a large number of animals coming up. We see the same thing for cetaceans. It's not just the south shore of Long Island, but we see that we have them in Long Island Sound. And some of you might have seen in the press where we'll have humpback whales in western Long Island Sound. We've had bottlenose dolphins in Long Island Sound. So not only are they stranding, but we're seeing uh, healthy animals there. Two years ago on Memorial Day, everybody remembers the beluga whales that we had in western Long Island Sound, right? That's pretty cool. It's really cool unless you're the person that's supposed to be responding to them to get people to stay away. Watching it in the news is the best place to be doing it. and I'm, Trust me, now in my career, I'm liking that a lot better. Um, but sea turtles, the thing that's interesting about this is we have sea turtles that occur all around Long Island. And we try to get people to help us 
walk the beaches during the fall in hopes of finding a turtle if it's on the beach. And I've had people ask me many times, where's the place to go to find turtles? And kind of the short answer is if I really knew that answer, then we would just go there and get them as opposed to covering all of Long Island. Um, and what we find is the more places we look, the more places we find them. So we're trying to get more, more people involved, going out, walking the beach. It's healthy. It's a lot of fun. It's easy to find a parking spot because it's the winter. So, you know, it's great. You can get really close. So help us out and do that. But this is the other reason why we're getting some live, live animals come in. When, this is Kim Dorham. She works with the Stranding Program at the Riverhead Foundation. Uh, her and I went out on one of our first entanglements back in 95, 96, a kind of little sketchy on the year. And we went out through Shinnecock. And, and I'm not going to say that our safety procedures have, were lacking then, but they've gotten better now. I'll say that. Um, you can see we have a PFD on. Uh, we went out there and we had one leatherback, and we would get a leatherback stranding every couple of years. So much so that you're like, oh, remember what we did the last time? Now we're getting a couple a year. So much so that when we went out on, on one of these animals here, the guys from the Coast Guard that were taking us out, his comment was, oh, I was out with you the other, you know, last month on this. I know what to do. And I'm like, that, that shows that the frequency is kind of changing when you're having people that rotate through and they're able to do that. We're also seeing leatherbacks here. It seems like a lot more. But we're not out there looking all the time. Uh, this is another type of entanglement that we see. That was, that was in, in some netting. This is in some line. This is another uh, entanglement that we went in trying to get it. Why I show this and why it's important to understand is getting the stranding program involved in the response to go out there and do this is critical because people don't always cut the right line. And, and you can actually disentangle an animal from the long line there and actually just have it entangled for forever, um, and that will be, become fatal. I was just up last Sunday. I was up doing a a necropsy with, with Kim Dorham as, as our necropsy team leader on a 47-foot right whale uh, that had a chronic entanglement. Uh, and it was up in Maine that, that we were doing this. So it, it really is a big problem for any of these animals. They really can't get out of it. So please make sure you call the hotline number and let them know. And it does happen for turtles. So where do we get the animals that we're talking to, talking about right now from some of the tracking work and stuff? Well, we get them from the stranding program. That's a very, very opportune way for us to, to collect animals and put tags on this. Uh, I've worked on numerous capture projects for, for seals where we've done live captures uh, for harbor seals, for gray seals, for adult gray seals. Uh, I've worked on live dolphin captures where we've gone out to do health assessments, especially at the Deepwater Horizon. There's been a, a large effort going on doing health assessments on them. So I, I've worked on those projects in Georgia, uh, Louisiana, and um, in Sarasota, Florida. So the stranding program is, is a cost-effective way to get these data, but it also is a bias. It doesn't tell us what's going on in the wild population. So we do need these health assessment projects uh, to continue to go on. Um, and this is the wild captures that we're talking about. And also the pound net program. Does everybody know what a pound net is? Okay, one person. So I really have to get this right. Darn. Um, we'll get to that later because now I've got to remember what it is. Uh, but the Pound Net program is a program where we've actually worked with local fishermen to, to uh, collect turtles and start doing a health assessment. It's a program that started with Okino's Ocean Research Foundation in the 80s as a result of the die-off that they had when people were saying, I wonder if turtles are here. And then they said, hmm, I guess they might be. And so uh, New York State DEC provided funding to uh, Steve Morali uh, to come down here and start studying and um, Vinnie Burke and um, Ed Standora and those guys to come down and start looking at turtles, and that's when they realize that they hang out here in the Peconics. Uh, the other partners that we have for wild captures, as I mentioned, seal captures, cetaceans, and sea turtle captures, there's, there's projects that go on that we work with NOAA Fisheries and local partners. This, I think when I was doing the captures, I was leading the capture projects for adult seals, and I had 19 people on the beach at one time. I had six boats that we were trying to coordinate. When they're coordinating the, the small cetacean captures, I think there was something like 60 people on the water at any given time. So it takes a huge effort from a lot of organizations to do this. And all of them are really kind of going in ad hoc. It's not like they're getting paid to do this. They come out and everybody kind of volunteers their time and they spend a couple, of, well, 14 days or so just sitting in the water. Um, I don't recommend Louisiana sitting in the water. It is pretty murky. Just don't think about it. Um, 
So I mentioned that we did this work with Steve Morali for the for the sea turtle program for the pound nets. Um, Cornell Cooperative Extension Wildlife Trust we actually partnered with. This is back in 2000, uh, the Riverhead Foundation um, and the pound net fisheries. So this program that started in the 80s ran until the late 90s and then it stopped for a while. And then in about 2002, we picked it up again. The predominant animal that you saw in the program during the 80s and 90s was really the, log the loggerhead and the Kemp's Ridley and a very rare you saw a green sea turtle. So the objective of the project was to reestablish the continu continued monitoring to start this program back up. Um, probably going to talk a little bit about where the problems came in with permitting because the pound net program is a state regulated fishery. So it's, you can't get a federal permit to do the work on these federally protected animals. So it became a real, um, you know, catch 22 that you couldn't get a permit to do the work, but the animals are still being caught in the, in the net. So we were able to only run the project for uh, from 2002 to 2006. Um, and, but we wanted to do more of a health assessment. I mean, tools have changed. We were able to look at it and try to look at contaminant levels. So we started, started the project. We wanted to compare these results to stranding data and see, if, see what they might, have, might mean. So we operated between July and November. And obviously, you see now the reason why we stopped in November is because cold stunning occurs then in fishery. So we were actually then dealing with cold stun turtles. Um, we operated with local fishermen. Um, and what they would do is the fishermen, when they would go to check their net, they would call in and say, I have a turtle in the net. One of the things that's interesting about New York is that the pound net fishery that we have here doesn't have mortality associated with being caught in the net. Whereas in other places around the, the country, there is mortality associated. Uh, Virginia had a, had a big um, issue with that and they had to make changes and modifications to how they fish in order to reduce that mortality. So um, it was kind of a really great opportunistic, no really low impact fishery for us to get animals that we would think would be less stressed uh, to move forward. Once we got the call, we would send a team out and we would do a field assessment. We would, we would actually draw blood, we take genetic samples, we look for uh, any, any type of epibionts and see if there's anything on the animal. Um, we would look for wounds, we take cultures, we, we basically do anything we could um, in order to collect the most amount of data. Uh, but the bottom line is the basic life history data of this animal is here, this is the species, this is how big it is is really the stuff that we didn't even know then. I mean, if, think about the 80s. We finally said that these animals were here. We go, go forward to what's happening now in 2002. We're actually starting to see what species you were having. And one of the things that we noticed as we went forward was we were seeing less and less loggerheads. So I asked the question, who knew what a pound net looked like? But here you go. This is what a pound net, this, this would be the coastline here. And this would be um, perpendicular to the coastline. The fish would swim along or the turtle. And they, they go into the net, and they hit the net, and then they make this turn, and then they end up in this, this bag all the way up here, and that's where they get caught. And so when the fishermen go out to, to basically fish the net, they're just swimming around in there with the fish. So it's a pretty, pretty good method for doing this. Unfortunately, in 2006, when we wanted to do this more, we couldn't get permits. Uh, the, the suggestion was that we go out and decide to actually just start fishing pound nets on our own. And it just seemed kind of like a lot of work. So we were like, forget about that. Um, but the bigger part of it is then we were putting in another pound net in the water for something for the animal to get entangled in. So we put, kind of put that project on the side. What I will say right now is that we're actually revisiting doing sea turtle health assessments in New York. I'm working with our colleagues down the coast. And uh, we're actually in the process of submitting uh, a research, scientific research permit so that we can start a sea turtle project here and start doing that work. So in the next year or so, we'll, we hope to be able to get that off the ground. And I know that sounds really funny considering I'm with the Pacific Marine Mammal Center, right? So it's, it's going to be a big commute, but it'll be cool, right? Um, actually, I'm with the Pacific Marine Mammal Center, but I, I'm stationed here. And the reason why I'm with the Marine Mammal Center is I do all the satellite tagging for their organization on the West Coast. Uh, they're trying to get into doing uh, more population monitor modeling and uh, monitoring on the haul-out sites for animals that they release. So we're developing a citizen science program for them out there. Pretty much the same thing that we're doing here. On the So we have a program that's going to be working on both coasts. Um, and I also run a specially, specially trained animal response team. We call it START. And it's an incident management team that's designed to work with major events and large-scale events, such as if we had 
a bottom nose die off that we had in 2013. Our team, I was the incident commander for that event. I was the on-scene coordinator designated by NOAA Fisheries. And so I brought together a team of people that were able to work and try to provide support for the Eastern Seaboard to respond to that, that, re, that uh, event. I also did that on the West Coast with the California Sea Lion. So the real difference is it's a place to hold your hat, but I seem to be moving around a, a lot more than just being here on, on Long Island or, or in Riverhead. I just came back from a research project that we'll talk about that I was away for 46 days and ended up doing a necropsy on a whale, finding two floating whales. Um, so I mean, it's kind of looking at this on a much bigger scale, looking at conservation on a much bigger scale and how do these things relate. And that's why we can see that this is taken from Maryland um, uh, a site because a lot of the projects that we've worked with, we've worked with the Virginia Aquarium on in Maryland, looking at what's occurring with animals in, in some of these wind, en wind energy areas. So what did we see during this pound net program to come back on, on task? We collected 75 animals, which is pretty cool um, it, during that period. We had 49 green sea turtles. We had... 24 Ridleys and two loggerheads, which is what I was saying is, is unusual. If you remember what I pointed out earlier was it was usually like loggerheads, Ridleys, and greens. And yet now we're starting to see a difference in the species that we're seeing in the pound nets. And remember that green sea turtles feed predominantly on vegetation. So it's kind of cool that we have all this work going on to restore the vegetation all around. And then we have these animals come in that are like lawnmowers trying to eat it. So it's really, really cool. So sure we didn't make a lot of friends with that one. So we had 11 fishermen involved in the program, and as I said, we had 75 um, turtles, but six of them were recaptures. So they, they were, they were recaught in, in, the, in the net. That's one of the ways that we look at, okay, what's, what size is the population? Even though we had a number of years of data, there was lag time in picking it up. It's a program that really should, should take off. As I said, we're gonna go at it a little differently by trying to do more active captures of animals and try to do the health assessment because of working with the fishery, but it shows that there's reason for us to start looking at these a lot more closely and understand what, what's going on in the program. And of those animals, three were brought to the, the stranding program to be rehabilitated. So it give, gave us an idea that some of the animals that come in might have other, other reasons. Without monitoring, we, we don't know what's going on. So what does that look like? Well, we did this project in the Peconics. So we can see that these are where a lot of the pound nets were, and the animals came up here. You can see the numbers that, we, that I just pointed out. Hopefully they match up relatively close. Um, what we wanted to do then is look at and say, what do strandings actually represent? We do understand that this is a back of the envelope calculation, but what I want to emphasize is these are the only data that actually did this, you know, well, in New York at all. We, we really only, only ever had a program that was operating a live capture with pound nets, and we looked at all the strandings that occurred. And so we wanted to get an idea of what does that represent? And you can see this is, a, uh, this is a year along the bottom for both of these, and this is the number of animals. And there's a different scale. This, this is up to, I think, 30 over here. And I guess I am going to have to get glasses because I can't see that. Um, and this is up to seven. So there's a, there's a significant difference in, in the number of animals we had. What this shows you is strandings represent a small portion of what's going on out in the wild, but they still have all the same threats that they'll have out there. So we can start looking at these trends and say, do we have a concern? Even in our stranding data, it might be a rare occurrence that one out of three animals comes up entangled. But if we realize that it's only representing a quarter of the population, it might be a bigger problem. I'm not saying that those are the numbers we're going to use now. Those are the questions that we're trying to answer now and get better data on. And that's why you want to do these health assessments to start comparing stranding data and see what they can start telling us. We can make some of these assumptions, but we should be collecting a lot, but a lot more data. So here we go. Collect more data, life history data. Do a lot more testing for biology and contaminants on, on these animals. All of this comes to money, and that's what we're hoping for in the next couple of years. We can actually do this. We do have samples well, probably all over the country by now from this project that, that are archived so we can do, do analysis. I mean, and keep in mind that these were all collected under a scientific research permit, so they're with the researchers that were leads on those projects, um, and we can still work, th work through some of those issues. Um, this is the way that we actually draw blood from, from a turtle here. We take it from the sinus right here, high-tech table um, that we make. 
just an angle table. Uh, this here is a picture of, of us using um, how we would inject the, the animal with a uh, tag so we can monitor them. We'll talk about that in a little bit. We want to continue tracking the movements because if we're only looking at what's in the, in the pound net, remember we had um, six animals that were recaptured. We don't know what they did in between. And so we really want to understand where are animals going and what are they doing. And so that kind of leads us into our program of what are the animals doing here, where do they move, what are they eating, and we could do that by looking at some of the stomach samples of the animals come up dead, or we look at the, the, the fecal matter, which is a really cool project. It's a really great project. I mean, when you convince people to look at feces for a project, I mean, you should sell cars, I guess. I don't know. So we're going to continue collecting these baseline data. We're going to look at abundance estimates for seasonal abundance. These are, these are the, the objectives that we put forth in 2006 that we wanted to do. And, I, and as I went through this talk, I was thinking, we have a lot of these, what are we going to do, what are we going to do? But I think it's important to show the evolution of what we were trying to do and how it takes so long to do it. Um, there's not a lot of support out there. There's not a lot of funding. So a lot of it is just done opportunistically. Uh, we can do tons of this, this with money. And I'll talk about some of that in just a bit. How do they use the habitat? Where are they going? Um, I've tracked some, some sea turtles that you could actually outline Long Island Sound by the movements that, that they had with the satellite tag. So they kind of just bounced along the fringe and then kind of went out. We have other animals that stayed in there and, and then have come up uh, dead later. So um, we want to identify any future thre threats or other things that we haven't thought about. Are, you know, with what they're feeding, is there a problem that we have with what they're feeding on in, in these waters? So, these are all projects that we're trying to work, work through. And we would like to do this all around, which is, as I said, that was 2006. It's, to the, help me out, 2016, right? Jeez. Um, so that's 10 years ago we wanted to start doing this, and we're probably a year or so away from, from really starting to do some more work with turtles. But it is on the horizon. When I first started going to meetings uh, with environmental managers, literally I would sit there, I'd crash a meeting because it was a public meeting and I'd hang out. And they would come to the point where they say, anybody have anything they want to bring up? And I would just say marine mammals and sea turtles. They said, what about them? I said, just want to get them in the room. We'll talk about them at some point in the future. And this is the future. We are starting to talk about them, and people are recognizing that they're here. So all the work that everybody's done here in the room is really starting to pay off. And we, we can't forget that. It's a slow process, but we're making headway. I mean, it's beating your head against the wall sometimes, but eventually the wall gives out, so they say. So the types of tags that we use, we have different types of tags. We have flipper tags. We have um, pit tags, which um, are uh, just like when you scan your groceries. It's a microchip that you can put in. People put them in their animals, and you have a scanner. It, it's supposed to last forever. Um, it has some positives and negatives. You have to get close to the animal. Um, same thing with the flipper tag. We have acoustics tags. We were fortunate enough to be able to work. Uh, DEC, New York State DEC was able to get us some acoustic tags. Uh, and we were able to piggyback on the arrays that they've used for sturgeon and other fish, fish, fisheries to find out where these animals are moving. Uh, I was amazed. I gave a talk up in, in um, Nova Scotia a while back for the fisheries uh, groups, and, and the amount of data points that they get are phenomenal on fish. I mean, we get like one or two points a day, and they get like thousands of points. So um, it's really cool. We should have stayed in that field. We would have had a lot more data. But in this case here, our data might get lost in the shuffle. So trying to get people to understand that, that this, this unusual tag that you might see might actually be a turtle has been a big challenge. Satellite tags are another way to go because they give us an active response to animals. They send a signal up to a satellite. The satellite sends that down to a processing center. The processing center then sends it to a computer. So basically, you can sit in your computer and just see what animals are going. When we first started this back in 2002, there was a lot of work that we had to do for programming. We were actually programming the tags in DOS, which was really interesting. Um, well, it was really a headache, and it was annoying, and nobody cared about that at all. I was grumpy as all heck um, trying to figure out how to do this, and everybody was like, oh, what's the big deal? But as soon as we put the tag out, the next day, everybody was standing at my office door going, where's the animal? Where's the animal? And just because I'm a jerk, I was like, I'm not telling you, because you didn't care before. So, um, but it's that quickly. I mean, within hours, you can find out where there's a tag. We just worked on, on uh, George's Bank the, the other day looking for what we thought was a tagged animal that was entangled, a whale. And we went out, and we were getting real-time data within a 
well, 45 minutes of where the buoy was. And what we were able to determine is that the buoy was off the animals with the gear. So we don't know if it's good or bad, but we know we were able to find the buoy. It was roughly 130 miles offshore. So we found a buoy that big with an aircraft from 1,000 feet um, with those points. So, you know, it, it's giving you some pretty, pretty interesting information. You could get information about these animals by looking at you know, if they're unusual, they have these, these notches here or anything, you can say, okay, that's, that's a, an animal that I heard, but it's not the best. Not all of them are that distinct. Um, these flipper tags are pretty cool. They, they're basically just like piercing your ear. You know, it's a, it's a metal band. They have information on it if you see that. This is really going to be interesting. I'm going to actually have to use two hands. Um, they, ha they use this very high-tech tool to put them on. It's a pair of pliers. I say this because when you're in the field, it's the one thing that you can actually don't worry about you're going to be able to do it. Everything else is electronic. So if you really mess up, you're going to mess something up. Um, problem is retention of these tags, in some cases, is as low as 50%. So there is a problem with that. You don't always get the best information, but everybody still does use it. This is what it looks like on the, on the flipper of an animal right here. Um, we put it in. Now we put them on the back of the animal. So we can actually, um, we usually put two on because we figure if you're going to lose 50%, at least there will be one on there. This is what it looks like a little bit better. The, the passive integrated transponder or the pit tag, which we inject under the skin, it comes in a syringe. You inject it under the skin. Problem is, is you need to use a $500 scanner like this over the animal, usually over the water. And I mean, we don't do that with our cell phone, so it's not really a great thing. You could lose it. So a little leery on, on how often we, we would do that. But you do get really cool data from some passive ways of, of tagging these animals. This is a picture of June 15, 2011 of a green sea turtle. This is, if everybody recognizes, this is Ponquag Pavilion right here. Um, I got a call from uh, our rescue program supervisor. She called me at 11 o'clock, 10 or 11 o'clock at night and said, Rob, you want to meet me at the beach at Ponquag? And I'm like, sure. Well, in strandings, you're like, yeah, whatever. Um, and they said, what are we going for? And she said, oh, someone called a live turtle up on the beach. And we're like, oh, that doesn't happen because this is the best thing to do. If you want to go into to wildlife rehabilitation or something like that, just say never a lot. It's really great. You'll prove how wrong you are. Um, we went out there. We went out on the beach. It was really dark. Wandered around. We finally found this animal. Um, you can see that she was crawled up here. She was about 230 feet from the, from the, the, um, the surf. She came all the way up the beach and then made this big arc and went all the way back down and back into the water. Uh, she, from what we see, she, it doesn't look like she did nest. Uh, but there's a couple of things that I did, which was really, one was a little creepy, and I'll admit this because I was really excited about this, and I said, I wonder how many times we missed this. So I went to the beach the next day and started walking up to people and saying, hey, did you see anything interesting on the beach or weird? And they're like, outside of you, no. Um, <laughs> So I asked because this is, these are the crawl marks that, came, that, that the turtle put on the beach. I spent probably an hour wandering around, walking across them, talking to people. Not one person said, hey, this looks interesting. We should tell someone. So I don't know if this occurs more often. We don't know. We, here we are on Long Island where we have probably the most densely packed coastline around, and yet we're probably still missing information. So how can you help? You can help by going out there and saying, hey, if you see something that you go, hmm, I wonder if someone wants to know about that, I'm telling you that I, I probably want to know. I mean, it's, it's cool. I, I, I don't have a lot going on, so it would be cool to talk to anybody about this. Um, the key here with this, is, it, once again, is these, these crawl marks, we could say, was the animal disturbed? Could it nest? Everybody says turtles don't nest up here. Many of us are probably aware that you know, sea turtles have temperature-dependent de sexual determination, which means the temperature of the nest will determine the sexual bias of the nest. So pretty simply, a warmer nest produces females, colder nest produces males. So the issue is, it doesn't mean that they won't nest here. They'll probably just produce a nest that actually produces more males. So you might have females. Some might come up. So what happens? Well, this animal leaves over here and goes all the way down to um, Delaware and actually nests there. And these are the hatchlings that were hatched later on. So it does happen. It, it can occur. And this was from an animal that was originally tagged in 2006 from a flipper tag. That's the way that we knew that. And I only talk about this is because you go out there trying to be prepared for everything. And the one thing that we didn't have when we were out there was a flashlight. So reading the flipper tag was really, really hard. 
Um, and I was younger then, so I probably, you know, could see it a little bit better. But you didn't think that it was going to happen. Once again, I don't, you don't want people to get up close to them. You don't want people to bother them. Um, but the key is we might be missing some information as we go forward. So the other tagging that we do right now is we, you put on satellite tags, and these are some of the tools that we use for this. This is a, um, a five-minute epoxy, and this is a 10-minute epoxy. Uh, this one is, is self-contained. It's just kind of a syringe that you put in. This one uses a gun um, and these two, two tubes here. Um, it takes uh, longer to set up. It's a it actually creates an exothermic reaction, so it'll heat up. So it's a little bit cooler than the one on, on the left. I haven't seen that there's much of a difference. Just some of the colleagues that I have on the West Coast have started using this, and um, I kind of went along with it because it's like cool. You can use a gun to, to do something, so that seems like it'll be fun. Um, so you put this out on the animal. Um, we've done it on a lot of seals. We've done it on California sea lions and Guadalupe fur seals. Uh, we've done this with sea turtles, and we also use a putty, which I haven't shown you. This is the acoustic tag giving you an idea. It's not very big, but we put it on the ridge here of the turtle. Some people put it down on the marginal skewed. Uh, we were able to put it out on 15 animals uh, that we had tags for, and uh, we can see where they put it on nine Ridleys and, uh, and six greens. And we did get detections on six animals, which I think is pretty good considering many people didn't even know what we were doing. Um, I want to pause here to, to just go back to that talk that I gave up up in uh, Nova Scotia, everybody was talking about these arrays that they had up and down the coast. And I was amazed to see how many arrays there were. And it w you couldn't have timed this better. I was, uh, I was the last in the room right before lunch. So I'm, I'm up there watching all these people talk, seeing all these arrays, and I realized all these arrays are where all of our turtles go, but they're not picking them up. And so all I did is I changed my talk a little bit and just showed the satellite tracking data, which showed all the, tag, all the animals going by the arrays. And then they all started to say, hey, we need to find out where those tags are and find out wh what's going on. So it kind of got a little bit more buy-in once they could see that these animals were here. Um, and it also started a project in Virginia working with the Navy uh, to, to work more with trying to understand acoustically what they're doing. Benefit, these tags are a lot more cost-effective than the satellite tags that we do. Satellite tags are anywhere from $1,500 to $5,000. There are some that are a little bit more. Uh, think about it as you're just taking five grand and throwing it in the water, um, and you're going to get some data from it. This is what it looks like on, on the back of a green sea turtle. This is uh, for a Ridley. Uh, this is one of the tags. We released it in September of 2010, and we got a hit on it back in February of 2011. Uh, it was off Cape Canaveral, Florida, so it had gone all the way down down south to where we would think. Uh, this is one of the questions that we always have is, what do the animals do with the tag on? So we were able to put the tag on, keep the animal in the tank at the Riverhead Foundation, a monitor it swimming around, and it was able to do everything that it normally did in there, so it didn't really seem to have a huge impact. Um, this is where we saw the turtle again. Uh, same stuff in here, detections. We had a many detections in, in uh, Western Long Island Sound in the New York Bight. There's an array looking for looking at sturgeons. And we had a lot of turtles in western Long Island Sound, which is unusual because we don't get a lot of strandings from the map, even though we have them in western Long Island, not western Long Island Sound, western Long Island uh, in the New York Bight. So off of Rockaways, we don't get a lot of sightings there. Um, but it seems that the turtles are hanging out there as well. Um, 141 days, so we, we are getting some tag retention. I want to pause on that for a second. Is One of the things that I do with, when I tag animals is, is we try to be the least evasive as possible. So we will always argue um, on the side of not trying to impact the animal as, as much. So we would we'll be happy if the tag would fall off, so to speak, as opposed to trying to go through these great lengths to actually keep the tags on. That's why you see a smaller footprint. So once we knew that we could do this, we could put tags on, then we figured bigger tags, um, satellite tags, we started doing um, back in 2007. And we did this with Atlantic Greens. We tagged 11 animals. Uh, and we had an average duration of 172 days. That was my lead into this of saying, I have colleagues that have had them out there for over 300 days. Uh, but our footprint is significantly smaller for what we do. This is, this is it. This tag is only about 130 grams. We try to keep the tag size um, to the animal less than 
but there is a change that's coming up now that it's not just the percentage of weight for the tag, it's actually the drag on the animal, so that's going to impact tagging of these animals through the stranding program. You're not going to be able to do that as much, um, which is why we're going towards the scientific research permit, because you can do it under a scientific research permit, you just can't necessarily do it with the stranding program. So these are the different types of tags that we have. They have different types of programming. They can give you uh, position, temperature, dive data, and tell you what the animal's doing. You can see this. Here's a tag animal. Came all the way down the coast, went all the way down to the Carolinas. Um, this is back in 2011, released in 2011. We got the same data from the, from the acoustic tags that told us the animals did that as well. Um, this is how we start building some of the data sets to see these animals are moving back and forth. It also tells us from a rehabilitation point that here's an animal that, this animal here was cold stunned. They rehabilitated it, put it back out in the wild, and it went and did what we think a turtle should be doing. Same thing here with a green sea turtle. This is an animal we tagged. Uh, we just recently did this, but this is hanging out in Western Long Island Sound. These are just some of the good points, uh, but it's hanging out in Western Long Island Sound. This is as of August that we had the animal moving around. Um, we don't get many sightings that back in here for obvious reasons, turbidity, um, but it's showing that the animals are in those areas. There's another green sea turtle coming all the way down, all the way down to, um, to Florida in this case, um, to the southern tip times when we don't have the tag. We're always worried about when we, when, we lose, um, when we lose sight of the tag in the sense of not getting hits, and then we get some beeline data. We're wondering if the animal's on the surface or, on, or, or in a boat or things like that. Um, but by looking at diving data, we can find out that the animal is doing something and the tag might be fouled. So one of the trade-offs is by not trying to get super aggressive with keeping the tag on, we might be having an issue with fouling of the tag. So the, so the um, saltwater switches might not be working as well. Um, or the antenna. And now the tags that we're working with now are actually have some anti-fouling um, paint on them, so we hope to be able to get more information. I showed this graph here for a green. This is a green sea turtle that we, we were able to go out with one of our uh, donors and actually release the, the turtle off his boat. So we went way out because we, we thought it was late in the season. We'll go out way out here, and the animal promptly turned north and went right up along the coast, right along where we would release it offshore. And and I say this because a lot of the things that we started to answer over the years was people would tell us, you have an animal that came up, you can't do this, and you can't do that, and you, sh you shouldn't do this. And we had very little data to support whether we could or couldn't. These programs have enabled us to try to support those answers that really show us that when we put an animal after rehab out into the wild, it does tend to go where it's supposed to go. There are exceptions when animals don't make it. We're actually working on a couple of them manuscripts now looking at sea turtle tracking data and working at seal tracking data to look at uh, rehabilitation success and classify the animals. I worked on a paper a couple years ago uh, looking at the same thing with cetaceans to be able to get, come up with an idea of whether or not you would think that it was a uh, positive or a negative outcome. And so now we have large enough data sets to be able to compare those. So we're hoping within the next year we'll have those out. Camps Ridley, we tagged a little bit more. Longest duration was 348 days, so that's kind of up, up there. Um, but, once again, the shortest duration is five. Um, whoops. Um, those, those are usually me, I, I would assume, uh, and, I, and I'm, I did a lessons learned talk not too long ago. Whenever you think you shouldn't do it, you probably shouldn't. It's really the best. Uh, I've had turtles that I put tags on, I'm like, ah, I think it looks good. I've had seals where I'm like, ah, kind of looks good. Very rarely do I get any great results from that. Um, so you should always really err on the side. Um, I've put tags on where I've actually pulled on them to have them come off and did the same thing, and they came, came off of my hand. So when it's a really short duration, unless it's really something that I can tell with the tag, I assume that it has something to do with the attachment. Could be that the animal didn't make it, but it's hard, hard to tease some of that out. Um, this is a Kemp's Ridley that we had that went all the way out offshore. Um, actually, I think this one went, went almost to the Azores. So, so, um, it stayed out by, by where the warm water was. It went out, it was during the winter months. This is stuff that we didn't think happened. And then coming back to it, when I would work with a lot of my colleagues, they would always say, we would tag animals and they'd say, oh, they're out there doing something, we, we, that's wrong. And then a little while later, we see that they kind of come back and do something else. We go, or maybe they do that. And so when you're starting off with, well, ends of zero, a lot of the information you're learning is, is firsthand. And now this is not something that's considered unusual. We assume that it does happen a lot more than what we think. Same thing with, with the loggerhead. This is, this is a, a loggerhead that went all the way out over 300 days duration, but it did go out offshore. Um, 
once again, something that we wouldn't think was, was happening. Now, this is the other thing that's really, this is where you guys can really help. For one, we know that these animals are prote protected. Some are threatened, some are endangered. We don't want you to get close to them. Binoculars are cool. If you see an animal that has a tag, you see an animal that has something on it, we want you to report it. And there's, this is the Northwest Atlantic Seal Research Consortium. We couldn't use NASCAR because they, NASCAR was used. But uh, this is a group of researchers that have come together. We, we've, we've been doing this for almost a decade now, working on trying to come together. We focus on seal issues, but we also have this marine identification uh, network and trying to get tagging information in and trying to get, collaborate on finding out, hey, what, what do people have? When I started 25 years ago, the way that we did that is someone would call up and go, hey, Rob, did you tag something? So it was on a phone, probably even a rotary phone probably back then. Um, but it was on a phone. Now we could go into the database here. We could see the type of tags that people use, um, and we could get better information. And, and it's not just researchers. It's the public. It's fishermen. It's everybody working together. So I just wanted to put a plug at, uh, in for that. And then talk about the... Um, and driving part of this home is the aerial surveys. I'm going to go through this a little bit quicker than I wanted to. We've done aerial surveys since 1995. We do it from a couple of different platforms. We've done it from a Cessna 172. They do use it from a Skymaster. Um, and we do it from a De Havilland Twin Otter. Um, big difference is bigger plane, two noisemakers, smaller plane, one. Big thing is you're going out over offshore. You want the bigger plane. You want a lot of noise. You want to be able to go out there. Um, and survey. This is a good platform. I just spent 46 days surveying the, the Atlantic um, off of New York and, and up to Maine with, with the same type of aircraft. Uh, that's how our abundance estimates are done for NOAA fisheries. They use that platform. This is how we do seal surveys because it's more coastal and we've done a, done a number of those. Uh, this is what the platform looks like. We have bubble windows on the side. We have two teams that are, that are in, in the aircraft. I uh, see the bubble window, the, the aircraft here. We have a team in the back working out of this bubble window. The teams work independently, and it's one of the ways that we're able to survey to actually um, find out here's your first team and here's your second team. Uh, they have a belly window where someone actually has to lay on their belly and look straight down to see what they're seeing because the assumption is you want to be able to see everything that's on the, on the line. So I guess you could say, yeah, it's a cool job. You get to lay down and look straight down. Um, for that, but we do this. We're going to be doing this with NOAA. We just did it for this summer for 46 days. We'll do it um, in nine days from now. We, I go back out in the field and start it again for another 46, and then we'll probably do it in the summer. Um, and this is where they get the population estimates from for, for all these animals. They use distance sampling, so the plane flies along. Um, and then what you do is when you see an animal, or in this case a turtle, you measure the angle, and then you can find the distance from the track line based on that. You're, you know that the assumption is not that you're seeing every animal, so you adjust for the front and back team saying, okay, well, we missed half of them, so then you, that's how you get your population uh, number. We did a project uh, from 2012 to 2014 working in the, in the Mid-Atlantic region. It was, it was a very undersampled area where we did surveys for this. Uh, I was out there, and our team uh, surveyed for every, well, every season we would survey, and it would take us probably about five days to do this. So we spent two weeks in the field. Um, and what was really cool is this is what we had right here. These are all sightings of, of sea turtles that we saw. And then we also saw bottlenose dolphins. So you can see back here, these are the lines that we flew. And every place we looked, we saw turtles, which is really cool because once again, everybody said, hey, there's not a lot of turtles that we're seeing. Um, but we are seeing them. We did the same thing off, off of uh, Maryland. We worked in a wind energy area doing some survey work. Uh, this was during, uh, we did this every month of the year uh, for two years, uh, which, was, which was kind of interesting, very labor intensive. Um, but we saw a lot of animals. I mean, there's a lot of, there's variation between seasons. Uh, those, are, those are data that we, we've looked at. Uh, we saw a number of sea turtles that were here. We saw, we also saw whales. And, and what's really important about this is that I know I'm trying to stay as close to sea turtles as possible, but I guess we've all figured out that I'm not going to stay on script as much as possible. I should. Uh, but what was really, really cool about this is that we went out and did this survey, and we surveyed January 11th and surveyed and had very few sightings. And then we went January 17th, and these dots right here represent 13 right whales that we saw. It actually initiated a, a dynamic area management closure for the area. Um, but 
it's a result of us actually trying to survey this area right here, and we just came up with a systematic design, and we were able to get data about right whales in that area that you previously didn't really have. So that was pretty cool, and that's why you're going to see right whale photos, because this is what we saw. Um, right whale here, you got some common dolphins right in its bow, you got another right whale here. Uh, they were able to identify some of them. I don't know which ones they were. I just don't remember. I'm getting older. Um, but this is, this is all of what's going on in the Mid-Atlantic. We don't know where these animals are coming from. We know that it's a migratory corridor, but how do they get from here to there? question we have right now is what are right whales doing up in the Gulf of Maine? Are they in Canada? There's a lot that's still not known, and there's changes in their distribution, and that's where these surveys that you can have multiple teams and have a platform that is able to look for multiple types of animals can help because we get a lot of ancillary data. It's important for me to mention that it's done under a research permit, a couple of different research permits. I uh, worked with the Virginia Aquarium and Marine Science Museum, Maryland Department of Natural Resources, um, uh, Maryland Energy Administration, so th they actually provided the funding for these, for these data that were collected. So what did I just do for 46 days? I worked with AMAPS, um, which you can read the top because I can never remember what AMAPS stands for, the Atlantic Marine um, Assessment Program for Protected Species. Wow, that's a mouthful. Um, these are all the lines that we're trying to fl fly. Very rarely do we have conditions where we can fly all these lines because we have wind and sea state that becomes a problem. Um, this is the first year where we've actually were able to fly every line that we had and flew some of them multiple times. Why I show this is because you might look at the, the area off of Long Island and see these orange circles here. Those are all loggerhead sea turtles. And we have some greens in there. And then, okay, just for the heck of it, this right here, this, these are a couple of sperm whales that we saw off of Long Island. So how far? That's probably about 80 miles offshore. I would have to, I could look at that. This is why we were seeing animals. This is really cool. This is flat calm. I've surveyed for 18 years and I've had a couple of days like this. We had, we flew the first week of the project out of six days we flew five days in conditions like this. So I mean it was unheard of, really cool data, a lot of fun. Okay, it was work. Wait, forgot about that. It's work. But this is why you're going to see a lot more stuff. This is a loggerhead sea turtle that you can see from the air. This is a loggerhead sea turtle that you can see from the boat. Leatherback sea turtle that you can see from a boat. Once again, if you're in a plane and you're seeing it at this level, there's probably a lot of things going wrong. You're not going to take any photos. Um, but these are the sperm whales that we saw. This is pretty cool. We had, had all these animals hanging out right off, off in this. Um, as my team members said, um, I usually don't break transit to very anything. I stay online because we're surveying this, and this is what we do. And, and, and they tend to pick on me about it. Um, but these are actually a little bit farther out than what we would normally survey on. And I said, no, we're going to break. And they were, everybody was silent because they didn't want to change that decision at all. But it turned out to be a pretty cool one because this is what we saw. Um, we circled them for a bit. Um, once again, this is, this is during the summer. It's just, just a month ago that we had these animals. Probably, probably about 40 days ago that we had them. So let's get into sea turtles to, to close this out pretty quickly. Um, Sea turtle strandings, we mentioned that they occur. We showed you as part of the graph. We can look at the um, species distri distribution that we have. You might notice that in the 80s, when I said the sea turtle program started, the predominant species that we encountered um, was the Kemp's Ridley. And we can say that that's probably attributed to the cold stunning event that we had, because that was early, early in the year. This is from 2015, showing you the, the animals that we had. I show you this graph because 2015 is exactly the opposite of the one that we just saw with numbers of animals. You can see that 21 of these animals were green sea turtles. Majority of the animals that we're encountering are green sea turtles now, um, and that, that's definitely a change. So what is cold stunning? Well, cold stunning is hypothermia for, for us. It occurs at temperatures less than 50 degrees Fahrenheit or 10 degrees Celsius. Uh, it is more common, seen, commonly seen in... Uh, or I should say that, that Kemp's Ridleys are actually more susceptible to cold stunning than any other species of, of sea turtle. And it's from this study that was done in 1978 where they actually took animals and they cold stunned them. They just saw how cold, what temperatures they did that. Well, now we're not going to be able to do that because they're threatened and endangered. But we came up with some pretty interesting information that said that um, it can occur around 10 degrees Celsius. Um, it could be fatal at five or six. We've had turtles that have come in at three and four, uh, and we've been able to revive them. So that, that number's a little 
a little subjective. I think the real issue is how long are they cold stunned for? At 20 degrees Celsius for, for uh, Kemp's Ridley's, they start to eat less. For greens, they'll start to eat less at 15 degrees. Um, at 20 degrees, uh, greens will, will reduce their swimming capabilities, um, and Kemp's Ridley's will become agitated. I know. How do you tell a turtle's agitated? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so it's, it's obviously a good study. You had some information that was there, but this becomes the guideline. The key thing that we look at, sorry, talk amongst yourselves. The key thing that we want to look at here is that Goldstone sea turtles occur all around Long Island, but they usually occur on north-facing beaches because one of the things that happens is during the fall, the wind direction is predominantly out of the north. So when the, an animal becomes cold stun, it'll start to float on the surface. When it starts to float on the surface, then the wind direction will push it up on our beaches. It does not mean that they don't get cold stunned out here. It just means that there's nothing to, to really catch them which is why we want to be able to look on all the beaches at any given time because if it's there, it's an opportunity. Um, early on in my career, I had someone call up and was really upset and, and mad at me, which is not unusual, but the, they said, I, I was on the beach and someone else was walking the beach as I was getting off. I'm like, okay, but you're not going to be there all day and the turtles can come up on any time. Um, we ask you to go walk the beaches after high tide because you're going to be able to see the most, most of the beach. But, Theoretically, if you walk at any time, a turtle can come up. The more coverage we get, the better, the better chance we have of finding an animal. Well, this is some back. Uh, Latham in, in, in 69 actually reported of a cold stunning event as early as 1924. This is out in Southold where they ha we had animals come up. So, and it's hard to tell what they were from the report, but the fact is it is a condition that is occurring. It might be a condition that's occurring more or less frequently, and those are some of the things that now, because our one year equals one year, we can actually start looking back and saying, hey, are there any trends that we can kind of tease out? Malin in 1986 reported on the, the cold stunning event, um, and that's where they looked at the distribution of, of cold sun turtles, uh, what species were there. Uh, Burke looked at the wind direction as being a factor, um, and we looked at which were the predominant animals. I mean, this is something that we're revisiting now to look at the changes and try to get those data back out. So here are your major cold stunning events when we look, look at it. This is showing you the, the graphs and looking at the fact that it's Ridley's Ridley's. You can look at the major event that occurred in 96, uh, 95. I don't know, Chris, if you were around for that at that time. Just started, so it was your fault. So now we know where the causal factor was. Um, but what you can see is these were actually loggerheads that occurred. The majority of the animals were loggerheads, which was unusual. And then now we can see that the majority is green sea turtles. So what are we, what are we getting from this? We're looking at a stranding program that is usually dealing with low numbers and people say, what's the value of those data? But they are probably representative of what's going on out in the, your environment and what's out there. Now, if we start building other projects on top, like our health assessment, we could probably start answering questions about threats a lot more. We need to integrate these programs in a sense of, of let stranding people work, get their data together, get health assessment people together, get population dynamics people together, and try to assess this in a lot better, better way than we've been doing it. We've been doing it very independently uh, going forward. Um, I don't want to say we should follow the pinniped model, but the pinnipeds themselves, we have done that for the last decade, starting to bring teams together to do this. So what would you see? You'd see a turtle on the beach like this. Um, it'll wash up. They tend to hang out with, with, at the rack line. They might be blending in like this right here. You can see that it has growth on it, which means that the animal has not necessarily been, um, been swimming for a while. Sometimes they're fortunate enough that they're upside down. They might all look dead. Any turtle that comes up in the fall, we consider alive until we do a lot of work with it, try to revive it. Unless it does not have a head, consider it being alive. So no head, dead, head, alive. Okay? <laughs> This is how they might look, no response. And, and back in, in um, 96, 97, we worked and we changed our protocol for assessing turtles and started to uh, warm them up a little bit more aggressively. And we have a different cu couple of different types of classes. We have class one, which is an animal that's moving around like this, which is an animal that's in 50 degree water. We have class two and three, which are different levels of moving around. So it goes back to that agitated state kind of thing, a little hard to discern. And we have class four that has no, no outward signs of life. This is the class that I'm going to talk about for 96, 97. Prior to 96, 97, none of those animals were ever revived. 
Now we've been able to revive a handful of them. It is not statistically significant, but if you look at it from alive or dead, there's a kind of a significance there. Um, the key is, I think that we were keeping animals cold stunned a lot longer, so then they ended up going into the dead column, so when we were more aggressive in warming the animals, it kind of keeps them away from the light, I guess, and then they, they kind of, um, they'll do, I'm going to go back a second, because they'll do this, and we tell, we used to tell interns all the time that they'll jump to life, and they all go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you would hear them, and we never told them how to get in touch with us because we knew we would never have to, because you would just hear them scream from the room because the turtle jumps to life, and it's really cool. Um, but it does happen, and if it happens a handful of times, then we're able to do this with endangered Kemp's Ridley sea turtles. We get pretty aggressive. I mean, this is us actually breathing for a turtle. Um, back in the day when we did this 96 and 97 event, I actually had two roommates, uh, and I was breathing for a turtle for three days, and my roommates were kind of helping me. I lost two roommates after that. They, they didn't <laughs> hang out. But it did occur. It did start because we started. You couldn't read your eyes in the <laughs> <laughs> They weren't cold stunned, so I didn't know. <laughs> but in a sense, this is when we were starting to intubate the animals and breathe for it. And what we found out is that we had two turtles that actually occurred. It was a great sample. We followed the old protocol on one, which is the one that we were breathing for for days. And then, the, then what we did is we said, hey, it's kind of alive. Let's get more aggressive. And we warmed another one a lot more rapidly. And that animal was able to be revived. So that's when we started stumbling along this, this path of, of doing a lot more rapidly. Uh, but we still, we still get very aggressive. You can see the flippers are moving. We take temperature. Um, and once again, we can try to get them into water as quickly as possible. We want to see this head lift. When we do that, then we start to get them to swim. Once we can start to get them to swim, then we need to get them to, to, to eat. The rehab on a sea turtle usually takes about 242 days. Um, we can, we're working on, they're working on trying to shorten that. But it feeds predominantly on like squid or shrimp or something else. So it is actually more costly to rehabilitate a sea turtle than it is to rehabilitate a seal. I didn't realize that for 20 years. And then I did the math, and I was like, 242 days, six weeks. Obviously, they're eating good stuff. So in summary, um, we're surrounded by sea turtles and marine mammals. I mean, they're, they're all around us. We need more sighting information. We need to understand this. We need to start doing some more health assessment work. Um, there, are, there are many threats for these animals, and we need to re be looking at it. Um, we still need to understand how these animals move throughout um, the Mid-Atlantic and New England and, and how they go into um, how these habitats are used. Um, we are actually continuing the surveys for marine mammals. NOAA is going to continue doing surveys. Uh, they're putting a lot of effort into sea turtles in the New York bite. And, and I don't think we understand the significance of, of a lot of this. When I first started doing this again, everything that we did, I would go to New England and go to New England and go to New England. And, and you know, this, this SEAL research consortium is based out of New England. And all I would say is, what about New York? And they're like, well, what about New York? Well, I finally got them to start basing some of the aerial surveys out of New York. Um, it's a little odd, they call it the, the food tour because when they came here, I didn't want them to leave. So we took them to a lot of really nice restaurants for dinner and now everybody wants to base out of New York. And I'm like, do you think like five million people aren't wrong? But anyway, um, the key is, is that New York and these areas are really becoming a lot more common for these animals and we need to start including that in a lot of our survey efforts. Um, otherwise, we're, we're missing a big por portion of the population. Um, the assessments, I, I mentioned it numerous times, but that's really on track for what we're doing. Um, now, this is the key. This is like the carrot and the stick. Well, I actually got a stick here. Um, the carrot and the stick. What, do you, what can you do to help? You can get out and walk the beaches. Look for these animals. If you see them on the beach, let us know. Do not necessarily move them. You don't, we're not asking you to do that. We have cell phones. Call. Call the hotline number that you saw on, on, the, um, on the screen. Let people know that are there. They'll talk you through whatever you need to do. Um, do not um, pick up an animal and carry it like a book bag underneath your arm kind of thing because that, that's, that's a bad thing. You don't want to have their flippers not able to move because they actually use the movement of their front flippers to expand their um, thoracic cavity so that they can breathe. So you don't want to do that. Um, key thing is, is if you're on the beach and you see an animal, try to figure out where the heck you are um, so we can, you can tell us. The other thing that you want to do is mark the beach and let us know where that is. I've been to a lot of places where it's really hard to find the animals again. So you can do that. Call the hotline number. Um, that, that's critical. So get out there and help us walk the beach. It's going to be a lot of fun being on the beach. Thank you.
Did I answer all your questions so there's not a one? That, what? Yes. That's a very good question. Um, there, there are a lot of different methods for, for, for altitude that people use. We fly at 600 feet. So what does that really equate to is that if anything really happened, we would just be like, oh, that's about it. 600 feet is not a lot. Um, but it, it is probably the best altitude that we could have for looking at sea turtles. We see sharks. We see schools of fish. Um, we, we saw a buoy that's this big. When you get to 1,000, it gets a lot, of, a lot harder, things kind of drop out, and, and that's our concern about some of the surveys that are being done going forward is, is that they're done. You actually don't need a research permit if you're above 1,000 feet. If you're below 1,000 feet, you need a research permit, which is kind of funny because the Marine Mammal Protection Act says stay 50 yards away, which is 150 feet. So, <laughs> yeah. So, go ahead. It's, we have nothing else to think about when we're flying around for six hours in the air on a headset. Yes? Well, the thought is, is that they're supposed to get out of here sometime around the end of October. And if they don't, uh, then they'll become hypothermic if the temperature changes. What probably occurs is, is if we have a cold snap, it might be a problem. I have this idea that, um, and I've had it for a long time, we just don't have a lot of data, is that what probably happens is the animals that are in western Long Island Sound are the ones that tend to become cold stunned because they move out. They all start moving out, and then we have a cold snap, and then they're the ones that become, excuse me, cold sun, whereas the ones that are for out, out further east, they're getting out and getting around, and then they're go, going out. So there's probably, just, it's probably more of a, a number of animals in the area, but when we have a mild, mild fall, we probably do get more animals out of, out of here. Yes? Well, they, they hatched to Maryland. They actually found, they, they found the animal up on the beach. They saw it nesting, which became a whole big thing because then they're kind of regulated by U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and so we had a lot, they had a lot of agencies involved. And then they had to take the eggs and they had to incubate them, and then they released them later. So, yeah. Yes? I started off by saying never say never. Um, uh, no, I, I, do th I do think that we'll see more of this. I think the biggest problem is we're prob we don't know how much we're, see we're missing now. Um, I, I can't remember how long ago it was, but it was probably in the 90s, probably 96. Uh, we had another green sea turtle come out in East Hampton and came out. It was dur during the day, though, and we got a call, and we're like, ah, it's not a turtle, but we'll go out. And sure enough, there's, there's a photo of a turtle up on the beach, you know, that came up and, and did this. So it, it probably does occur a little bit more than what we think, and, and if you're going to have differences in climate, you'll probably see changes like that. Chris, I've been ignoring you for the... Yeah. <laughs> you know, the tank that you had a couple that were going out in the Azores that was originally in Italy, say a fog and had it three far out. Any dive data on that? Good question. Yes, that's what we're working on. Those are the data that we're working up, working up now. And, and, and one of the things, as I said, the, these were, um, and we, we've, we've gone to great lengths to share these data with, with other researchers so we can do it, so we've, they're up on public access, um, so that, that we can start working on collaborating on some of these projects. I move towards using time depth recorders and getting dive data a lot sooner than, than a lot of people did because of the cost, but I really felt it would be cool. We're just at a point where we can start looking at teasing out some of that, and that's where the manuscript's really coming, is that we're going to look at the, the percentage of time at depth, what they're doing, and what they're doing at, at, at each spot, which is um, just taking a little bit longer to work out. Um, I mean, although with the acoustics, it's, it's 
hundreds of thousands of data points. These are still a lot that you have to really tease through. But yeah, we'll, we'll have we'll have those data. It's good. It's it's really it's really cool stuff because we're we're well. I should say it's cool stuff. It's not cool stuff when you're spending you know two a year and two you know. But now that we're at that point, we have the ability to, to do that. So um, and that's part of my my as chief scientist. Uh, do you want to wake up now? <laughs> 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 Don't notice that. I'll cover for you. Don't worry, Joe. <laughs> um, as chief scientist for Pacific Marine Mammal Center, I mean, that's part of the focus is, is to be able to work on a lot of these data. And we have a joint proposal in right now that we're working with with a lot of network, um, exchanging network uh, participants bringing their data together so that we can analyze that and working with some people from moat. So, yeah, it'll, you know, well, you know, so don't be doing all, all winter. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah, that was cool. The question was on, on the last graph, um, what I learned is, is if Kurt's going to be in the room, don't put everything up there because now I have to remember this. Um, we had a, a, a hybrid sea turtle. It was a cross between a loggerhead and a green, I believe. Yeah, a loggerhead and a green. And the interesting part, which is really funny because I took that slide out to explain this. Because I was like, because I didn't want to go over. I took one slide out. Uh, so, <laughs> um, but it was a cross between a hybrid and a green. It came up cold stun. And what was really happening, which was really cool, is that I would go in, and I'm just going to say me or another bio, and I would look at it, and I'd go, oh, it's a green. And I would change the chart. I'd go, it's, it's, it's not a loggerhead. Someone else would go in and go, oh, it's a loggerhead. So we kept changing the charts until we were finally like, what the heck 